So th- that makes sense when I'm selling my company and the new buyer doesn't want me to go and compete with them the next day because I got all the know-how and probably right. industry experience. But now there's this big thing with the FTC coming up with a rule talking about non-competes for employees. What is this rule all about? So um, President Biden, he issued an executive order, um, I believe, in 2021, and he wanted his administration to set their eyes on non-competes. Um, that pa- or he issued, he signed the executive order, and then nothing happened for a long time. And in late December, unbeknownst to lots of folks, unless you're paying attention, uh, the FTC quickly uh, rushed through, I say rushed, some consent actions against two types of employers. One was in the security guard industry. The other one is a glass container manufacturer for for the food industry. And they got those types of employers to agree not to enforce non-competes and not to have their workers sign non-competes. And within days of that, that's the first time the FTC has really been focusing on the non-compete world, um, the FTC issues this notice of proposed rulemaking. This was in early January, um, and there's a comment period through March. And if the FTC gets its way, it has identified non-compete agreements with workers as an unfair method of competition or an unfair business practice that they're trying to crack down on. So basically... You know, when somebody goes to work with a company, they'll give them an employment agreement and there's some kind of a non-compete. If FTC has their way, that non-compete is null and void. It's going to get thrown out. The non-compete will be thrown out and the FTC would instruct um, employers to notify the employees that any non-compete that they had is no longer enforceable. And you have to provide notice to them. Uh, that they're non-compete in, in writing, that they're non-compete is unenforceable and that the employer won't enforce it. So now th- this is a pretty big deal. Uh, I don't know if people are giving this the attention it deserves, but if this happens, and I know you got go to gotta go through the comment period, there's the litigation that's going to come down, but let's say it survives this. This pretty much upsets how business owners have been doing business for, geez, as long as I've been alive. Right. I mean, this is pretty this is a pretty big deal because from what I remember, employee comes on board, non-compete is signed when what the business owner is trying to protect is don't take the name of the customers and don't go sell them something to my competitor. Right. And so now, you know, did it was there were there issues there? Sure. Right. I mean, I, I could give you examples where an employee comes on, accepts a job. First day on the job, they're filling out some forms, and lo and behold, the employer comes in and puts a document in front of them, says, oh, here's your employment agreement. By the way, you're agreeing to this non-compete. And the employer is, or the employee is saying, okay, I have no choice at this point. I've already taken the job. Is that the most ethical way of doing it? No, right? It doesn't seem fair, at least. Um, but that's not the reason why they're, why they're doing this, right? They're just saying the non-compete by its nature is problematic, not because employees are being coerced into signing this That's right. agreement. That's right. So employers in general, I would say, do have the uh, bargaining power in the employer-employee relationship. It is customary for lots of employers to include post-employment restrictions when the employee leaves. Um, there's not just non-competes, but there's also non-solicitation provisions, non-disclosure provisions that usually are designed to protect the business's confidential information. Uh, the FTC obviously has its site set on non-competes. Um, employee non-solicitation provisions likely uh, would not be affected by this FTC rule. Protection of confidential information likely wouldn't be affected by this rule. But it does apply to contractual provisions that would stop a worker from seeking or accepting employment with somebody else after you leave your employer. Um, and the FTC proposed ban extends to contractual terms that are not called non-competes. Um, the FTC rule discusses de facto non-competes, and, and that can be other contractual provisions that, in effect, restrict an employee from going to work somewhere else. Um, so employers can't get, if this, if this rule passes, the employer can't get around it by calling it something else. Okay, so a lot to unpack there, because you said something that caught my ear. So I'm going to give you an example. Somebody goes to work for an an organization in sales and they've signed an agreement post hire that says um, you agree that it'll be irreparable harm if this data gets out. We don't even have to show that there was damages. 
you owe us a hundred thousand dollars. And so the employee's like, okay, I'm scared and I'm just not going to go work for anybody else. I'm not going to disclose this data. And if I heard you correctly, you're saying the part about disclosing the data wouldn't be impacted. So they still can't disclose the data, but this rule would allow them to go work for a competitor, but they can't disclose the data. So employee employers are going to be safe on that side. Is that right? The FTC rule that's being proposed, it would not invalidate um, the protection of the confidential information. There's a separate issue with your question about, you know, liquidated damages and and penalties. Um, you know, the FTC rule does talk about uh, repayment of training expenses. If an employer pays um, for an employee to be trained in the business's, um, you know, skill set to pay to develop the employee, Sometimes employers have the employee agree to repay that money when they leave because that's an investment that the employer made. If that agreement doesn't have a reasonable relationship to what the employer paid to train the employee, the FTC says that could be a de facto non-compete, and we would invalidate that as well because an employee might not be able to leave and go somewhere else and still have the financial wherewithal to repay that money. Wow. And then what happens in cases of deferred compensation, let's say, where there's a vesting schedule that says, so long as you're in a non-compete period, you know, there's, it's not a taxable event. And all of a sudden, FTC rule comes in. Now we've busted this. Now the non-compete is gone. And now there's a taxable event. Neither the employee nor the employer wanted this, right? So it's really not serving the interests of the employee at this point. Is there any discussion, or I, I know it's way early and there's no guidance on it, but what, how, does the FTC proposed rule address that issue? So it, it doesn't address that issue. Um, and I would say in most cases where those agreements are in place, you're dealing with senior level employees or right. executives who are being given that type of interest. Um, I would note that the FTC rule does not have a carve out for executive employees or senior employees who you know, the government or other employers might say those are the real employees that we're trying to protect from improper competition. Um, sure, the government wants to stop employers from um, having non-competes with, I'll say, hourly wage workers, where they say it's just not fair to have uh, a particular employee who's making minimum wage not be able to leave and go to a competitor. He or she may not have access to our confidential information or our goodwill, Um but there's not a carve out for senior executives or high wage earners. So basically, this is a tornado brewing or a hurricane here in Houston, <laughs> right? Um, and, you know, if I'm a owner of a small enterprise, um, I, I better start studying up on this stuff, right? And, and right now, where are we in this stage? You said we're about to have a comment period, the 60-day comment period? So we're in the comment period. Uh, the FTC delayed uh, publication of the proposed rule by a few days. So originally, it was going to be March 10th. Now it's March 20th. I checked today, and through midnight of last night, the FTC has already received not more than 9,000 comments. Um, those are publicly available. Um, you and your listeners can can go and read these comments. I scrolled through them. Sure. Lots of them uh, that I saw um, are more from the employee side who supports the, sure. the proposed rule, of course. I'm sure within all those comments, there's also um, comments from you know the executive or the, the membership side, the management side, I, I should say, um, where they're opposed to opposed to this right. but until march 20th the ftc will be accepting and reviewing those comments that could potentially change the rule before it's published um and then today actually the ftc said that they're going to have a panel um on february 16th where they're going to hear from members of the public about their experience with non-competes um so they're listening to the public we'll see if that affects the proposed rule at all so wh what sorry jack you had a question well, it's, it's what's going to be interesting is and we've talked a little bit about the various sets of restrictive covenants. Um, what's going to be interesting is is how the courts and um, people who want to enforce restrictive covenants look into the other provisions, the non-solicitations or the confidentiality, as a way of kind of hooking in a non-compete. So that it's you know it sounds like from Kellen that the the government's trying to take a hard stance to be like we've we know what's up. We've seen. Uh, uh, employers try to lean on other restrictive provisions as a way of getting at the non-compete, even if a court, depending on the jurisdiction, decides, hey, we're going to throw out the non-compete. And, and I've seen that, or we've seen that in our firm in, in, in deals as well, where 
um, there's not an on compete, but they're not happy about what happened and they're going to sue under the confidentiality provision. So, um, for, for folks like Kellen who are in this space, um, it sounds like there's a lot from a legal standpoint, even if the government, uh, uh, and the Biden administration get their way on non-competes, I imagine you're going to have a lot of creative lawyers find different ways of still trying to conceptually hold that in place. Or in a lot of cases we see at least hold the leverage in place because a lot of times a lot of employees agree to non-competes. We just want them and we advise our clients on the employer side to get them because of the leverage it holds. Because if they start, an employee starts to do things that you're, that are a former employee that you don't like, you want to be able to wave the stick at them and tell them to stop. Um, and so if, if, uh, if the Biden administration gets its way, um, good or bad, it's, it's going to give a lot of lawyers an, an interesting opportunity to litigate certain issues. But I think it's also going to give employees a lot of leverage back to say, well, uh, Biden says, or like yeah, the administration right. says, I don't have to, I don't have a non-compete. So, you yeah. know, leave me alone. I'm not going to do anything. And all of a sudden that leverage is also gone quite a bit as well. Yeah. So uh, in Texas, from a Texas law perspective, yeah. um, Texas enforces reasonable restrictions uh, that are post-employment and there are certain hoops that employers have to jump through. But uh, at bottom, the Texas Supreme Court says reasonableness is the touchstone to uh, enforcement. Um, and our, our state law says that a reasonable restriction can be no greater than necessary to protect the uh, employer's legitimate business interest, and usually that's protecting the confidential information and goodwill. Obviously, this FTC rule goes much further to say we're not going to have any types of non-competes, um, and that should alarm business owners who are providing their employees access to their vendor list, their price list, their 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 customers. Um, and um, in the in the commentary to the to the proposed rule, uh, the government did reference scholarship that says um, without non-competes in states that uh, restrict or don't enforce non-competes as much, it does limit uh, employer investment in their employees and the provision of confidential information because they're nervous that those employees could take that information away from their business and use it to compete with them. So that was a lot of lawyers speak there. Give, give me the, <laughs> the, the pure English version. So... The, the part about scholarships, what, what, what was that? So I, I mentioned that the FTC um, hasn't been focusing on non-competes. Up, right. up until December 28th of last year, not a lot of oversight by the FTC in the non-compete world. Right. Yes, there was the Biden executive order that I mentioned a, a year or so before that. And then they, um, they published the consent judgments to say we're now in the non-compete world. Uh, and a few weeks later, this proposed rule comes out. Um, because the FTC hasn't really been looking at non-competes, a lot of this rule is based upon professors and scholars who have published articles to say that non-competes reduce uh, ah. wages for employees. And these are all the bad things that non-competes are causing. I notice in the FTC's proposed rule, they do identify a potential consequence of enacting this rule. Employers may not give access or train or invest in their employees to develop them. Yeah. Interesting, right? So you have the academics who've never spent a day running a business <laughs> telling the business world how to run the business. It's a, uh, it's interesting. Um, I want to go back to how business owners protect themselves. So uh, you work with employers and if they do it right, they probably have handbooks and manuals and procedures in place. So if this rule were to come about or, some form of it. What does this do to existing manuals and procedures? I mean, do we have to go back and relook at all this? And if we don't have one in place, do we better get one in place, right? So uh, Jack's comment is right about enterprising lawyers who represent employees will not only target non-competes that employers are 
improperly asking employees to sign if this ban takes effect, but also provisions that aren't called non-competes but could be construed as restricting a departing employee's ability to find work elsewhere. Uh, so employers should review what policies they have in place that could be considered a de facto non-compete, as the FTC calls it. Uh, but you're right, uh, small businesses or medium-sized or large biz businesses, they should have um, a set of policies and practices in place to set the expectations for what the employee should and shouldn't be doing um, in, in their work. And that could include... Um, handbooks, like you mentioned, and it also can include non-disclosure agreements, and those can have restrictions on employees' ability to use that information only for the furtherance of the employer's business interest, uh, return of property and confidential information whenever they depart. Uh, those policies should be in place uh, regardless of this FTC ban. Now, is there anything that the FTC has put out, or could you take a wild guess as to what kind of damages that uh, an employee may claim? I mean, is it just a simple, hey, you can't enforce this, let me go? Or are there punitive damages? Are there statutory damages that might come out? Although, can there be statutory damages when this is a rules-making body coming up with this and it's not legislation? I know we're going back to civics class here on how government <laughs> works, but <laughs> I'd so, like to hear your thought on that. Sure. So the FTC ban doesn't uh, create a civil uh, a civil mechanism for an employee to say, you're violating this uh, FTC rule or regulation. However, the FTC does have the ability to impose civil monetary penalties on employers for their violations Fines. of their regulations. Can you take a guess at how much that how much that is? Fifty thousand dollars a day per employee. I don't know. So you read it? Am I not? Is that right? It's fifty thousand one hundred twenty dollars. <laughs> is it really? All right, I just per, guessed per violation. That was a guess <laughs> per violation, and if it's an ongoing violation, uh, I believe it can be on a per day basis. You're kidding so me. So if the FTC. Woo. Uh, publishes its rule and this ban goes into effect and an employer doesn't take it seriously, the FTC technically can issue those types of penalties. Now, the likelihood of immediately after a rule going into effect, um, the FTC and the regulators might not come knocking, but that is out there and that is a stick that the FTC has to say you need to comply with this rule. Wow. Well, I don't think any business owner wants to have their name on a court case as the standard bearer for adjudicating this uh penalty here. Um, so besides the fines, are, are there any potential risks that the employer may face in civil litigation with an employee? So if this ban goes into effect and the employer doesn't do what the ban re would require, which is to notify the employee that their non-compete is no longer enforceable and that the employer is not going to enforce it, um, an employee could hire a lawyer to file uh, a civil action requesting what's called a declaratory judgment where you ask the judge to declare that a restriction is not enforceable. That can be can be costly. It's supposed to be efficient, and that's supposed to uh, be resolved a little bit faster than a normal lawsuit, which can take a long time. And the judge has the discretion to award attorney's fees uh, as are equitable and just, and then you know the, the employer could be paying for the employee's lawyer to pursue that action. Yeah, because you know, the first thing that went to my head is, oh my God, all these PI attorneys now lined up on contingency basis, solicitation letters to all the employees at these companies saying, let us know. And now we got a potential problem where these PI attorneys have turned all these employees into the Gestapo, <laughs> right? Send me your forms and procedures. I mean, you know, I'm not being paranoid here, but you know, when you're dealing with millions of employees, it just takes one or two disgruntled employee even if there's nothing now you got the cost of litigation the time the effort so it behooves the business owner or the employer here to get ahead of this right sure to start reviewing these things and make sure that they're in compliance because you don't you don't want to wait until after the fact that's right and in your example about um a lawyer sending out lots of letters. Here, here's a document or an agreement that that I think my clients and, and other business owners should have. Um, and Jack and I have we've done this before um, several times. Employers should have a dispute resolution agreement with their employees, and that would set the groundwork for if there's a dispute in the future that you employee have against us, your employer, or vice versa, this is how we're going to resolve it. And there's different choices that the employer can make. Some, some prefer to be in court. Uh, some prefer to be in arbitration. If you're in court, sometimes you want to have a jury of your peers deciding the issue. Uh, other parties uh, like the 
a very well educated judge to decide right. the issues because they think the judge might be more likely to reach the correct result. Um, and then there's other provisions that an employer can and as a management side lawyer should have in place, which is a class or a collective action waiver that stops employees from joining together um, to generate that big piece of litigation that's very expensive that, that you're referencing as a different lawyer possibly sending out solicitations. And, and what's likely, and I was talking earlier about leverage, is that the advice that we would probably give our clients if there is the opportunity for a declaratory judgment is saying, um, if you go after that employee, you're going to get a counterclaim and now you're stuck in a lawsuit and you could pay for those. Uh, you could lose and have to pay for um, the employee's attorney's fees. So that that's a, that's a kind of fundamental shift in leverage that didn't exist before. All right. So at this point I'm putting my employer hat on and I'm saying, okay, the current environment may not survive this rule. And so from a business strategy perspective, I may need to figure out what I do with my customer list, just like you mentioned that it might change the landscape. But at a minimum, step number one, am I getting on the phone and I'm calling someone like you and saying, hey, come on in, review my policies and procedures, see what I'm missing, the dispute resolution or whatever else, and then put something in place in case this rule does take effect. Because at the end of the day, most employers, they want to do the right thing. They want limited headache, want to be efficient. They want to move on. They want to run the business. They don't want to deal with this stuff. So mm-hmm. what are the steps? I'm the employer here. What's the first thing I should do right now? So an employer should understand whether they have these types of non-compete provisions in place right now. If, if from an employer side, worst case scenario, these non-compete provisions um, are unenforceable after, the, after a ban takes effect, you need to know whether you have those provisions in place such that you uh, notify, you have to rescind and notify the employee that it has been rescinded. You need to know whether this ban affects you. Some employers don't have non-competes, right? I mean, right. not every business needs needs a non-competition agreement. Um, but then you also need to dive a little bit further and possibly with legal counsel, reviewing what agreements you have in place with your employees and that's that are in your policies to whether those could constitute a de facto non-competition agreement such that it would be within the scope of this ban. And then alternatively, you can rely on counsel to help give you advice about setting up other provisions that employers should have regardless of this ban that help set expectations for if a dispute arises later. Yeah. So if I have policies and procedures and or I have employment agreements, for sure I need someone to look at this right away. I think they should. Yeah. Now, we talked about the comment period. It's right. on March 20th. I don't expect um, you know the sun to come up, and then all of a sudden we have the ban out there. We talked about potential litigation, but business owners should get ahead of this and understand what uh, policies and procedures they have in place, whether those are enforceable. Um, certain agreements need to be a formal contract between the business and the employee to be enforceable. That's um, separate and apart from the handbook, which, again, I mentioned sets the expectations for um, what your employees need to be doing or, or not to be doing. Yeah. Um, and, and now would be a good time to make sure that you have your ducks in a row in case the ban takes effect. Yeah, there's there's certain situations in the um, employer, 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 employee relationship where they might – it wasn't – they didn't in, in, um, implement the non-compete when they were hired, but maybe they implemented it when they gave the employee a bonus or when they introduced the employee to a um, uh, a plan where they become an owner. And in the plan document, in that plan document, there's some restrictive covenants. So, because um, that's what I know we would put in ours. So there are, it's not just going to be in maybe the employee handbook or the agreements. It could be in other places. And from what you said earlier, unless you own over 25%, um, those non-competes and those em- employee ownership plans can go away as well. Yeah. So now this theme of putting leverage more on the employee side, I, we've seen this coming for the last couple of years. One of them was a few years ago, you know, if you were an independent contractor, you get the 1099, then they carved it out so they understand the difference between t- regular 1099 and 1099 for personal services because they're trying to collect data. Basically, there's a movement, like in California, for example, where... 
there's no such thing as a 1099 contractor who's working, right? Everyone's an employee. And it seems like on one side, you got the FTC and the current administration, uh, labor unions, right? More collective bargaining and basically getting rid of 1099 employees or contractors that are, you know, employee contractor, whatever you want to call it. So on the business, on the enterprise side, who's leading the effort with the FTC to oppose this rule or get the rule, you know, watered down to a point where it's basically they think they got something, but nothing's changed. Who's leading that fight? So lots of special interest groups, um, you know, restaurant associations, medical associations, chambers of commerce, they've already come out and <clears throat> voiced their displeasure with the proposed ban. I think you're going to see a lot more of that. When I was scrolling through the, the public comments that I mentioned earlier, seeing lots of individuals, um, I assume those special interest groups that are um, – pro-employer, they will have a very robust opposition to this, and I assume it'll be submitted closer in time to the to the end of the comment period, uh, but there's going to be litigation. You know, the, the, the general phrase of there will be lawyers, um, yeah. it, it's coming in terms of whether the FTC has the ability to implement this type of rule. Uh, they have never declared a non-compete provision like this to be considered uh, an unfair uh, method of competition, which is what they're doing. Um So I think employers need to review their documents and procedures like we talked about, but they also need to be mindful of litigation and and whether an injunction takes effect to enjoin this from taking, taking effect. And, and we talked about employer employees, but it's good that you mentioned independent contractors because there are a lot of situations where businesses uh, for various reasons, try to qualify individuals as an independent contractor. Sometimes it's clear cut, and then there's like a multi-factor test. Um, what about why? What about me? Just or what about business owners saying, you know what? I'm just not going to have employees. Um, I'm going to try to enforce non-competes by saying they're independent contractors. Does the FTC address that? So, so good point. So we've been talking about employer and employees. Yeah, this right. FTC ban doesn't use the word employees very often. They use the term worker. And ah. worker is very broad, and it would extend to your example. It, it applies to interns, paid and unpaid interns, contractors, employees. Um, so the FTC understands your hypothetical, right. and uh, businesses can't get away from uh, recharacterizing who the individual well, is. Well, yeah, and, and we, we keep saying the theme is, of at least this administration, they're going to force everybody to be classified as an employee. I mean, it's where it's headed, right? So we know this is the game. Now, I don't know if you were involved or you followed the whole DOL rule, the, the fiduciary rule with the DOL a few years ago. And so it was in the middle of the administration change, right? So the two administrations ago started it, and then the last administration basically changed commissioners and killed the rule. So there's that. That could still play out. I mean, you know, we got litigation. We got potential administration changes in the future. Uh, something's probably going to get done. It's just to to what degree um, it's going to get done. So, But as of right now, your understanding is they're casting as broad of a net as possible to try to include everybody in it. And so you know, something's going to happen here. That's right. Yeah. No carve outs for, like I mentioned, highly, highly paid employees. Um, what's interesting is most states, uh, myself and some colleagues at my firm, we, we wrote a paper or, or an alert on this, on this issue. And we pointed out that 47 out of the 50 states allow non-competes in some circumstances. And most of the time, the test is, are those restrictions reasonable? That's what most states around the country have. There's three states that, uh, that, ban, that ban the non-competes. Uh, and then there's 11 states in the District of Columbia that say, if you're a high wage earner, you can have the non-compete. But if you're not, uh, then you can't have the non-compete. The FTC is... Uh, purporting to supersede all of yeah. those individual states' rules and just have a flat-out ban. Do, do you think this is more a negotiation tactic at this point where they're going to ask for so much that if they give a little bit, they still get a lot? You, you think they're just starting off with just asking for something ridiculous, knowing that if they fall short, they still got something with meat on the bone? It's very possible uh, in the notice of proposed rulemaking when it's inviting comments from the public, one of them is um, let us know what you think about the scope, the very broad scope, right. uh, including whether it should be for highly paid employees. And that may be um, 
that may be by design. Shoot for the stars and let's yeah. see where we land. But uh, the commissioners uh, on the Federal Trade Commission, they've got the numbers to vote to pass this, and they did. Right. Uh, but there is one dissenting commissioner who has um, issued a statement when this was passed in opposition, already foreshadowing the legal challenges and her belief that those challenges will succeed. Yeah, it, it seems like they're, they're basically, I mean, this is a great negotiation tactic if you're on the FTC side. You're basically going to let your opposition negotiate against themselves here, right? So let, let's, let's, see, uh, let's see how this uh, all plays out. So well, One sorry. more question is, is, and we started with this, was does it apply if you sell your, your business? Is that carved out? So um, there is a carve out, but it, it depends on who's selling the business and how much of the business they own. There's mm -hmm. a 25% ownership threshold such that uh, those non-competes could be enforceable. You know, as we discussed, when a seller of a business, when, well, when a buyer is buying a business, they want to buy everything mm -hmm. and they don't want the seller to leave and start a competing business. Mm -hmm. uh, then they're not buying, you know, 100% of the goodwill of the company that they're paying presumably lots of money to buy. Right. So in those cases, as long as it's not a very minor owner of the company, those non-competes uh, likely are to survive if this ban passes. So let me, okay. let me ask you a question along those lines. So I was talking to somebody today. Um, I'm actually looking at hiring a business banker, somebody who used to work as a business banker. And I was talking to another business banker and asking them about non-competes that, is, that is typical in the banks. And they said, well, typically it's about a 12-month non-compete. And I made the comment. I said, oh, well, you know, that FTC rule, that may go away. And they said, well, by the time the rule is implemented or it goes away, the non-compete's still valid. So what's going to happen in the in their immediate time. Right now, let's say somebody's out there and employer gets upset that they went to work for a competitor. Are these employers, knowing that this may be coming down the line and, and who knows, judges could say, hey, you know what? This is coming down the line. I don't care. Uh, do they still have strong grounds at this point or did, did, did the ground get a little shaky right now? I think, I think employers still have uh, solid ground to enforce those restrictions, particularly if you can demonstrate uh, what's called irreparable harm, where you cannot be compensated uh, by money damages two years down the road whenever your lawsuit for a breach of contract, for a breach of the restrictive covenant, finally plays out. You need immediate relief because a former employee took a customer list, took a price list. They're actively targeting you know, relationships that you introduced he or she to. Um, so I don't think the mere proposal of this rule would would or should stop an employer from trying to enforce their rights um, until until the ban officially takes effect, if it does. But you mentioned banks, and I want to point out that uh, this rule would not apply to banks, savings and loan institutions, federal credit unions, common carriers. There are certain types of employers that the FTC um lacks jurisdiction or the rules wouldn't apply to. So there's a very narrow subset of employers that this ban may not apply to, uh, including state and local governments. Um, but of course they got to give themselves an out. <laughs> it, it, it still, it still leaves a wide swath of folks that this would affect. So, so you mentioned banks. So banks, is it just banks or all financial institutions? The language isn't specific as to banks, but, um, you know, like I said, federal uh, credit unions, savings and loan institutions, uh, it might depend on how the bank is formed, whether it's, I've seen, you know, national associations being banks. Uh, but for those types of uh, employers, they need to look in to see whether there's an exemption for them where this ban wouldn't apply to. You know, I, I normally don't give my opinion, but I'm going to ask it in a form of a question. It's a rhetorical question. You don't I, give your opinion. I, 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 don't, I don't like giving opinion. Look, the, the law is the law. Our job is to say, okay, how do we interpret this and how does this impact our clients? But it, it boggles my mind here where, you know, you have, they're, they're talking about competition or they want to spur on competition. Yet when I look at these major corporations and the mergers and the lack of competition, that's impacting a lot bigger swath of society. Yet again, why are we going after the mom and pop, small business? You know, it's something to think about. That's all I'm asking. Like <laughs> something to think about. And, and when you mention special interest, you know, always gets me to think. Um, anything else that we need to know on this particular topic of non-competes that if I'm an employer... Uh, and also, as if, if I'm an employee, right, if I'm an employee 
And I'm thinking about, you know, getting a job. And, and we talked about this uh, earlier. Um, oftentimes, these non-competes are presented post-hire. When you're all excited first day on the job and you just sign away, like, well, I don't want to lose this job that I just got. Does this now, you know, as, if I'm an employee at this point, you know, knowing that this is coming, does this give me additional leverage right now? So a couple points to it's something I think Jack mentioned earlier and, and you just did. Um, employers need to be careful about foisting a non-compete or any restrictive covenant upon an existing employees, because in Texas, at least you can't have a restrictive covenant that is uh, what's considered a naked restraint of trade, where it's a document that is the non-compete sign this. Usually it's part of a bigger agreement, a confidentiality agreement, an employment agreement. And once you join the company, it's possible that the employer has given confidential information to the employee. And a month, a year down the road, it, it can be more difficult for an employer to say, now sign the non-compete. Because a lot of times the consideration for that non-compete is I wouldn't give you, Jack, my confidential information, but for you agreeing not to use it against me, not to compete with me. Well, if Jack's been working for me for a year and I've given him access to all my confidential information and goodwill, then there's an argument that the one year down the road non-compete lacks sufficient consideration to make that an enforceable agreement. There's other ways to make it enforceable. Uh, Jack mentioned uh, paying a bonus. In Texas, employers often have a misconception of, I can just pay $500 or $100 to get the employee in exchange for that money to sign the non-compete. You cannot buy a non-compete in Texas. So um, th that's a common misconception that I receive from potential clients mm -hmm. saying, this is an easy way to do it. I'll just pay he or she some money. In Texas, you need more than that. So in this example, then, if, you know, person is on the job and all of a sudden she gets documents placed in front of her saying, here's your employment agreement, tucked in it is this non-compete. Is that legit? It can be. It can be. It can be tied to additional confidential information. It, it, oftentimes people get a promotion. They're in a new role at the company, and they're now going to have access to more sensitive financial data. Um, that can be sufficient consideration for an existing employee as opposed to a new hire. Uh, oftentimes it's easier to have those agreements signed on the front end, of course. Right. Sometimes specialized training can be the sufficient consideration that you're trying to protect. Um you know, for the first year of employment, I didn't train Jack along a certain line that's specialized to my business. My competitors don't know how I train my team to be successful. And after a year, I want to promote Jack. And um, sometimes it can be tied to membership interest. You're trying to engender loyalty. Right. Um, if Jack really loves his job, my company, he's going to perform really well. So I'm going to give him a little piece of the pie. Uh, that can be, although it's not money, it's not writing right. a check. It is financial in nature. So in my example though, she takes this job. She's all excited about having a job, lending the job that she likes. Employer comes in, puts this document, employment agreement inside is this non-compete. And if she says, wait a minute, we didn't talk about this in Texas. Correct me if I'm wrong you, you, at will employment, right? So the employer at that point could say, sorry, you're fired. And now you've lost the job. So it's kind of not fair, right, in that situation? But it is the way it's done in practice. In, in practice, that's right. Um, by default and in most employment uh, relationships, it is at will in nature, which means the employee can leave whenever he or she wants, and so can the employer. And the employer has the upper hand in terms of setting the terms of employment. Um, uh, I have clients all the time come to me when they're, when they're setting in motion this dispute resolution yeah. agreement that I mentioned. And they said, well, what if my employee doesn't want to agree to the forum that I want to select for resolving disputes? And I said, you have the ability to say these are our rules. And if you want to be an employee of the company, you have to agree to them. Yeah. Well, so look, you know, I want to be fair, right? So we're taking <laughs> the side of the business owner here. But maybe if industry, we change the way we handled these if we are up front, full transparency up front and negotiating in good faith and everybody knew what they were getting into, we might not have the FTC coming in saying this is unfair, right? So maybe this is what industry needs to do is to say, look, we will change our practices where everything is, I think it's in New York now where major employers have to publish what the job posting, how much it pays. So full transparency for everybody's sake, level the playing field, and now we don't have to have, you know, regulation like this coming down with a hammer on us. 
Yeah, and there can be uh, better communication uh, with the employer explaining to the employee why these restrictions are necessary. It's not because the employer wants to, you know, jeopardize an employee's livelihood whenever he or she stops working for me, but we're going to give you confidential information that our competitors don't know about, and we can't have you go to the competitor on day one after you resign or after we let you go, um, and you're going to help the competitor out, and they're going to give them, you know, for example, a jump start without them um, incurring the expense of de developing the business. One other comment we haven't talked about, I know we're, we're close to wrapping up, I think. Um, there's a bill in the Texas legislature, in, in the state of Texas, where a representative has um, drafted a bill and he is proposing to outlaw non-competes in Texas for employees that make $15 or less or no more than $15. Who's got non-competes there? You'd be surprised. Aren't really? You? Okay. You'd be surprised. <laughs> okay. Um, that, that's where I mentioned uh, non-competes exist not just with high wage earners. We've talked about senior executives. A lot of employers just have that as another policy. Here's a handbook and here's a non-compete, and they might not be making $15 an hour. Um, it remains to be seen whether that's going to have any traction in the state legislature. I have my doubts about whether that's going to pass in Texas, yeah. but there's other states that have passed that. that. That sounds like an employer did that just to have leverage over this poor person, and that's just not right. I mean, look, I want to be fair here. You know, we, we like working with business owners, but what's right is right. And so, uh, wow, I, that yeah. just seems very harsh. It can be, and that's why when clients come to us and say we need an employment agreement and we talk about different terms that can be in there, sometimes they'll say, and, and I want a non-compete, and I always have a discussion with them. Why do you need this? Why do you want it? Um, and then we have to talk about the reasonableness of the restrictions. If it's you can't compete anywhere in the industry for X amount of years in Texas, industry-wide exclusions yeah. are not enforceable, um, and you need to make sure that it's as narrowly refined as possible. Okay. Um, so I know you've written on this topic and you continue to write on this topic. Are you planning on just giving summaries on your LinkedIn account or your blog or uh, so, to keep us informed? So I am monitoring this ban. Like I said, there's going to be litigation. I'll monitor right. that as well. Uh, myself and some colleagues at our firm, we issued an alert where we summarized what the proposed rule would require of employers if it's passed. Uh, I'll stick to this, and um, if you if you follow me on LinkedIn, we'll have some links to future articles about this topic. All right, we'll put we'll put it at the uh, on the bottom of the video on YouTube, so people could uh, follow you and stay uh, stay on top. All right, thanks so much. Information contained in this podcast and accompanying video have been derived from sources believed to be reliable. This content is not guaranteed as to its accuracy and does not purport to be a complete analysis of the topics discussed. Analysis is based on assumptions that may not come to pass. None of the content should be construed as legal or investment advice. You should consult with a qualified professional before implementing any strategies discussed. All expressions of opinion reflect the judgment of the speakers on the date the video was recorded and are subject to change.